ఓకే చే ప్రశ్న ఇట్ లుక్స్ లైక్ ఇఫ్ ఇఫ్ మెమరబిలియా ఇన్ ఫ్రంట్ ఆఫ్ యు ఇట్ షుడ్ బి నేచురల్ కలర్స్ ఓకే yes honorable members i'm very sorry um, yeah i will deal with the picture later as long as you can hear me i apologize for coming a little bit late because uh, the ipad just slipped out of my hands and fell on the floor on the tiles and cracked uh, around 10 to so i'm very sorry about that and i was trying to fix it and i couldn't succeed so please bear with me we welcome everybody on the platform south africans who are joining us on different social media platforms of parliament and yourselves honorable members you are also welcome so i also welcome the representatives of the we welcome the collective of the representatives of the department of international relations and cooperation ambassadors that may be joining us on this platform in particular we also welcome our presenter who will be taking us through the situation uh, in uh, libya we are going to before we give us the nail an opportunity to do some elaboration on the introduction of our presenter today we will take apologies lobabalo Uh, thank you chair we we only have uh, three apologies chair uh, sir the minister is attending cabinet honorable uh, mishwe is attending pc on police will join the committee at around 11 uh, and then we have another apology from the tg the tg at bereavement uh, we have uh, tdg monyela who is the acting tg uh, thank you chair Okay, honorable members, any other apology? None. As you know, honorable members, we did indicate that one of the things we'll be doing today here is to understand the political situation that is going on in Libya. As you know, Libya went through some difficult times. and now has to prepare for the elections there so to understand how the situation is, is unfolding uh, we then invited a guest who is going to help us through understanding the unfolding uh, situation uh, here and that guest is the department of uh, department of international relations Uh, and cooperation uh, you heard from the apologies that the acting dg of the department has a bereavement so what has happened in my discussion with the department uh, this morning is that that uh, demonyela was will uh, will then do the presentation uh, on behalf of uh, the department in an acting capacity which has been designated by the minister in line with the powers that have been delegated to the minister by the president of the republic so i will give uh, uh, the department the opportunity then uh, to do the presentation after the presentation and our members it will be interaction uh, with the presentation and i hope by then uh, we will have wrapped up everything where we will talk about the workshop which is going to to happen the retreat which is supposed to happen for the portfolio committee to plan for the year and um, the, the the ending of this year and the financial year which is starting 2022 2023 so we'll be looking as to where we come from the last financial year which is ending now and then we'll be looking at 2022 2024 dadumya uh, thank you sir is deputy yeah. minister mashikhola mene 
Oh, I wasn't aware that you are here, Deputy Minister. How's, uh, how's things? No, we're fine, Chair. I just want to do opening remarks then. Um, yes, yes, yes. That's, that's the proper way. Sorry, I wasn't aware that you are here. My apologies, my dear comrade, my leader, my sister, my mother. Thank you. Over to you then, Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, Chair, and greetings to yourself and the honorable members of the committee. Uh, Chairperson, uh, South Africa foreign policy vision is to achieve an Africa, African continent that is peaceful, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, united and prosperous, and which contribute to the world that is just and equitable. South Africa pursues this policy vision guided by the African values of Ubuntu. The strategic focus of the department chair is guided by the National Development Plan Vision 2030 as unpacked in the medium term strategic framework 2019 to 2024, which inter alia is in line with the African Union Agenda 2063 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 2030 Agenda. During the execution of South African's foreign policy, DECO works to contribute to all seven MTSF priorities, which are with a focus of the seventh priority, which is a better Africa and the world. In doing so, the department must contend with an environment that is interlinked with regional, continental, and global developments, including fluctuations and disruptions. South Africa's foreign policy is implemented within a highly dynamic and challenging global environment, which at the time is unpredictable. Our presentation today plays South African's foreign policy approach with the content of political and electoral developments in Libya. The current global environment is characterized by among other things, threats of the illegal use of force, transitional organized crime, the displacement of population due to civil conflict, global irregular and illegal immigration due to conflict, poverty and inequality, the rise in populism, tensions over the control of strategic resources and geopolitical influence and trade wars. There has also been an increasing trend toward unilateralism, protectionism, nationalism, populism, and an inward looking focus on countries' domestic priorities. Strong tendencies to pursue national interest and the fragmentation of global decision making are emerging. Multilateralism, which is under threat, remain a focus point of South African foreign policy and engagement are primus on the need to advance the development priorities of developing countries by influencing multilateral process. The Libyan case suggests that conflict resolution is still relies on the UN or regional peacekeepers to bring about stability and that an ownership-based process led and driven Libyans themselves remain a distant reality. The Libyan case also suggests that instability often involves foreign interest and a race to influence, conquer, or even secure natural resources from African, African continent. Similarly, military maneuvers to those that play out in the Syrian conflict appears evidence in Libya. To promote peace, security, and stability on the continent, South Africa used its, use its simultaneous presence in the UN Security Council and its position as chair of the African Union Assembly of Heads of State and Government to strengthen cooperation between the UN and the AU. South Africa will need to do more. That is especially within the African Union High Level Panel on Libya 
to contribute to Libya's pro progress towards free, fair, and credible presidential and parliamentary election in order to realize an African continent that is peaceful, democratic, united, prosperous, and which contributes to a world that is just and equitable. Honorable Chair, in terms of the bilateral relationship, Libya is widely known to have supported South Africans during the anti-apartheid struggle, including with military training in Libya. Formal diplomatic relations between South Africa and Libya were established in 1996. Subsequent diplomatic missions of both countries were opened in Tswane and Tripoli, respectively. South Africa today has a structured bilateral mechanism with Libya called the Joint Bilateral Commission, the JPC, of 2001 at a minister ministerial level. Since the uprising in 2011, that was later backed by NATO under UN resolution, the JPC has not held a session. Due to security concerns, South Africa, like several other countries, has also closed its embassy in Tripoli. As Libyan authorities seek to find stability, they have made calls for countries to reopen their embassies for the resumption of bilateral relations. Following the ousting of the former President Gaddafi in the post-2011 environment, Libya has been struggling to establish democratic institutions. There has been a lack of government capacity to control militias who refuse to subject themselves to the rule of law under the government. Violence between rival militia, foreign troops, mercenaries, tribal and religious groups, competing for control of certain territories and resources has deprived the government of the opportunity to move forward on establishing strong democratic institutions. Government institutions which are meant to unite during the political process towards democracy continue to undermine each other. And additionally, political leaders appear to put their, their comfort in privileged position above the need of ordinary Libyan citizens. Libya remains deeply divided and continue to suffer from a lack of unified political leadership. The East, which is UN-backed government of national unity, and the West, which is led by the general Khalifa Hadfa and support base, recently portrayed a polarized geostrategic division and is still divided with element of tribal clashes amongst different tribes and armed militias in Libya. Some members of the international community are similarly displaying unilateral interest of common approach by external actors has also become a glaring issue during the Libyan political process. There is a threat that if the situation in Libya continues to be division between the Tripoli and Tripoli, the ongoing political and security tension in the country has been the reason why the elections scheduled for 24 December 2021 did not take place. The interpretation of Libyan People's Dialogue Forum for 2021 which outlined that the mandate of the UN-backed government of national unity will expire on the 25th December. February 2022, anti-government of national unity groups led by General Hafta impose a new prime minister, Fatih Bashaga. Bashaga. This move was endorsed by the parliament, effectively meaning that the country's two concurrent prime ministers follow the refusal of the current government of national unity recognized prime minister to hand over power. Parliament has deemed the government of national unity mandate post 2020, 24 December 2021 
as nullified and requested of its parliamentary committee to hold election within 14 months from its constitutional amendment. The government of national unity is, however, pursuing election as early as June 2022. And Prime Minister Alpha Al Dabab, on the basis that election have not taken place, is refusing to step down and continue to receive the support of the UN and the West. He escaped assassination attempt in his life on the 9th of February, 2022. The attempt on his life has led to an increased military presence in Tripoli. South Africa, therefore, Chair, stand ready to assist Libya and to share her experience in reconciliation, constitutional building process, and democratic transformation of the state. In the early days of post gaddaf Libya, South Africa, through the exchange of high-level delegation offered to the National Transitional Council to share her experiences in transitional justice, transformation of the state, unification of statutory and non-statutory forces, as well as the development of the economy. As a member of the African Union High-Level Committee on Libya, chaired by the Republic of Congo, South Africa, will continue to engage the various Libyan stakeholders to promote and undertake the dialogue. I thank you, Chair, and I request that the acting uh, DG is given a space to, is allowed to introduce the presenter of our, 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 our information uh, this morning. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Comrade Deputy Minister. Over to you, Adam Nyan. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you to the Deputy Minister as well. Uh, honorable uh, members uh, of the Portfolio Committee, uh, good morning. We have prepared a presentation, uh, and firstly, let me appreciate the, the invitation, Honorable Chair, to allow the Department to share our views and analysis of what's happening in Libya our fellow African countries. So we have prepared a presentation which will be delivered by our colleague, Mr. Fadl Nasruddin. He's the chief director responsible for North and Central Africa. And um, with your permission, Chair, um, uh, Rev Fadl, uh, please um, take the floor and take the committee through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Acting DG uh, Manjala, uh, Deputy Minister, um, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee and colleagues. Uh, good morning and thank you for this opportunity to um, engage in, I think, what is a very important discussion uh, because what is happening in Libya uh, is of grave concern. And I would like to start off by noting that um, as the chairperson said, Libya has been going through uh, a very tough time. I would like to perhaps um, uh, add to that to say that Libya uh, is going through a very tough time, is continuing to uh, experience a tough time. And by all indications, my conclusion uh, at the end of the presentation would be that um, unless um, something very different uh, occurs, in the processes that we are discussing, um, Libya may in fact um, uh, not only continue to have difficult times, but may in fact regress even further. So this is a very timely discussion, and I do thank the um, Portfolio Committee for inviting us to, to engage in this discussion. Um, uh, Chairperson, the, the, uh, um, the presentation that is there uh, on the screen, um, I'm going to ask that um, we just go to to that outline, um, but not necessarily to the to the slides. The deputy minister, uh, in her introductory remarks, have touched on many of these. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I'm going to just um, pick out certain uh, factors which I think I just want to to add to um, the um, comprehensive. Um, framework that the Deputy Minister has laid out in the introductory remarks about what is happening in Libya and where we stand with regards to the um, ongoing situation. 
Um, as we we will recall, um, uh, uh, in 2011, when um, uh, Brother Leader uh, Gaddafi was deposed and and, and uh, killed, um, Libya was plunged into uh, chaos, and and um, as the saying goes, the centre did not hold. Um, and this essentially uh, brought um, into play many layers within Libyan society um, into, into conflicts um, and sub-conflicts that has made it very difficult for Libya to chart a way forward, uh, um, both in terms of the formal processes of um, uh, developing a constitution um, and maintaining law and order, uh, essentially of um, establishing a post-conflict uh, state in which um, the citizens can uh, carry on with life um, and rebuilding and, and, and development aspects. This uh, situation uh, has deteriorated, but with the intervention of um, the international community at the multilateral level um, has uh, um, greatly assisted um the 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 uh, situation uh within libya and most importantly uh, that was the bringing about of a ceasefire um to the rivalry essentially what has happened is um libya has been divided into to two main uh, um, uh competing uh, geographic sectors the one from the east and the one from the west the western uh, sector, uh, if you wish, is led by um, the government of national unity, which is the UN recognized authority that governs, um, uh, that essentially should be governing uh, Libya. And um, of course, the opposition, which uh, has broken away and um, uh, has contested the legitimacy of the uh, GNU, the government of national unity, has been uh, General Haftar's uh, forces. Um, uh, in the um, in the east uh, side. Now, what has complicated uh, the uh, already uh, complex situation within Libya, uh, which uh, has tribal, ethnic, and linguistic and historical um, elements to the, the sh constantly shifting alliances, has been the fact that there are so many outside forces also that has. Um, uh, played a significant role in the uh, trajectory, uh, not only of the conflict, but in possibly how uh, the situation might eventually um, be resolved. This is mostly played out at the multilateral level, but we must also recognize that there has been um, significant bilateral interests uh, um, that have played out in this conflict. At the multilateral level, the uh, United Nations remains seized of the matter and actively engaged, and I'll come back to that uh, a little later. At the, also at the multilateral level, the African Union remains seized of the matter, um, and, and, and I'll uh, touch on that as, as well. However, at the bilateral level, um, the two sides have received um, uh, military and other forms of support from uh, specific countries. Um, to mention uh, a few examples, um, uh, General Haftar's side received um, support from, the, uh, from Egypt, a neighboring country, as well as the uh, uh, Emirates, whereas the government of national unity side was bolstered by Turkey and by Qatar and others. Um, again, adding to this uh, um, complex situation is that all uh, of mercenaries, and in particular, we can talk about the Wagner Group, um, the, which is a group known to be uh, um, of Russian uh, origin as, as, as um, mercenaries, um, acting essentially on the side of um, the Eastern Bloc, um, uh, the General Haftar, in other words, um, through, through Egypt. So um, with these external players making the situation uh, even worse, the path towards establishing um, uh, governorship, gov government and governorship uh, of, of Libya through uh, parliament has been uh, extremely difficult, as uh, Deputy Minister pointed out, 
the Prime Minister just recently had an attempt uh, on his life, and this was uh, the second time this has, has happened, in fact. Um, uh, and uh, we now have uh, an, an even worse situation that has evolved. So um, that uh, is by way of, uh, of, of just some background to uh, the elements that I want to, to, to touch on. And these come from the sort of um, more global perspective um, that we wanted to, to start out with. Um, and as we uh, are seeing, um, this happens in the uh, context of um, a situation where multilateralism is, uh, uh, as has been pointed out, um, under threat, but also that there's an increasing trend now of big power projection um, and uh, geostrategic interests um, overriding the issues of uh, sovereignty of countries, overriding issues of um, uh, um, development, coexistence, etc., in the interest of um, uh, not only border security but broader security for um, the the, the uh, regional and uh, global powers. So this, I think, is an important context for us to 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 look at the conflict that is happening um, there. And of course, for us with the, in the African continent, this goes against the principles that we espouse about silencing the guns about reducing conflicts and bringing about um, constitutional uh, changes of government and peaceful resolution of conflicts, etc. So, Jefferson, um, what we have uh, at the moment is at the AU level, um, and, and, and uh, the last meeting that took place on 7th July 2019 was at the heads of uh, state and government uh, level. And this, um, uh, through this uh, meeting, um, the AU uh, process, which uh, takes place under the auspices of um, the AU High Level Committee on Libya, uh, uh, which was established um, with uh, Niger, Mauritania, the Republic of Congo, and South Africa as members. Um, and this High Level Committee, the HLC on Libya, um, was uh, part of the AU Peace and Security Council, uh, or is not was, sorry. And the objectives that were, were laid out, uh, uh, I think, are very clear and specific. That there must be a ceasefire, um, that there must be agreement on how the international community would uh, engage in supporting the peace process, and that an inter-Libyan dialogue is necessary um, uh, with various components to bring about um, a governable state. Um, and the three legs of that inter-Libyan dialogue would be on the economic, political, and military levels. Um, and I think um, these are important um, uh, elements that the African Union um, have put on the table as a, a credible way forward. But of course, there are um, um, competing um, plans, uh, both at the uh, UN Security Council level, and then of course, by the two factions, the two main factions within Libya themselves. Um, so South Africa's position uh, is in support of the SADC position, as well as the, the AU uh, position uh, on um, the way forward uh, in Libya. And South Africa, therefore, um, wishes to, to emphasize the need for a political solution, uh, a solution that would be inclusive and would bring about uh, security and um, uh, 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 effectively um, deal with uh, um, disruptive external uh, influence on these processes that would allow Libyans to determine their fate and to determine um, their institutions and to elect their leaders. And South Africa stands ready to, to um, support that process. Um, and, 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 and therefore, South Africa works closely um, through the African Union uh, to do that. Now, the situation as it has unfolded within Libya was that Elections were uh, uh, to have taken place on uh, 25th December. 
which would have meant that the current Prime Minister's term would end on the 24th of December, that is last year in 2021. Um, but the uh, uh, elections did not take place, and this was then delayed by a month to 24th of January. Uh, and again, the elections were not able to take place due to various reasons. Um, one was uh, obviously that the security situation um, for credible elections to be held was not there, but there was also debates about constitutionality and um, how uh, this should take place, given that um, questions were now being raised as to whether the uh, Prime Minister, al uh, um is now still legitimately in his post and whether the administration that he runs, the interim administration, enjoys legitimacy. Um, uh, since uh, the elections that were supposed to have taken place would have now had um, the uh, legitimacy of having had uh, the uh, voters in Libya uh, elect their leaders. Um, this has resulted um, now in a, a, a very difficult situation because the January elections did not take place. And so, uh, as I alluded to earlier, they are now within Libya also then. Um, two uh, rival plans. Um, uh, the uh, recognized prime minister uh, uh, um, of the GNU um, continues to enjoy the support of the United Nations um, um, with regards to uh, him leading a process for elections to take place as soon as possible um, and to create the conditions for free and fair elections. He has um, noted that he uh, would like to have, in June of, uh, of this year, to have legislative elections and then for the legislature to then usher in a process um, through which the other institutions of the state could uh, be brought about, including then um, later also to have the um, constitution itself put to, to referendum. The the rival faction, however, has, um, uh, in light of the failure of the elections taking place in January, um, elected uh, to uh, uh, through Parliament um, have their own uh, Prime Minister um, uh, uh, put in place. Uh, and so this has um, meant that the Haftar faction has their own roadmap for um, uh, elections to take place uh, within the country. And they have uh, put forward um, uh, the rival um, uh, Prime Minister Fatih Bashaha. Fatih Bashaha has now declared himself the Prime Minister, so we are facing a situation where uh, Libya has two Prime Ministers, um, the, uh, the one that's internationally recognized saying that he will not step down and cannot step down because his mandate was in fact to usher in the process and that the, um, the hiccups in the process um, are notwithstanding, he should be allowed and supported to, to um, organize credible elections. Um, again, this has um, brought about the kind of instability where um, uh, the complex domestic uh, um, factions, rivalries, uh, tribal and ethnic differences play out. And um, the external influence in, in this must not be underestimated. Um, and so we now have not only a stalemate, but um, rival ways uh, in which uh, Libya is proposing to go forward. This means that um, at the AU level, uh, we have to re, uh, um, uh, revise how best to support um, the situation and who to work with, etc. And so, to this uh, end, um, on 6 February, um, uh, His Excellency uh, President Dennis uh, Sasson Gueso uh, of the Republic of Congo, who's the uh, chairperson of the AU High Level Committee on Libya. Um, uh, expressed his uh, concern um, on the failure of both parties 
uh, to come to some kind of agreement um, uh, and to hold the elections as was uh, scheduled. And that just uh, poses a risk for uh, peace and stability, not only in the country, but um, for the region as a whole. Um, he urged the Libyan parties to respect the decisions taken by the different international meetings um, on Libya and uh, emphasize the need for the ceasefire to hold. Um, I'm happy to, to report that the ceasefire is holding, although um, low-level skirmishes do continue. And of course, there is um, a very, very um, uh, concerning situation with regards to um, the point that the Deputy Minister also raised, um, namely this uh, illicit trade in arms, um, the smuggling of people, narcotics, etc., uh, which is of course also a major concern in Europe because Libya has become a main conduit uh, for, for for people who are um, transiting from our continent through to try and get into Europe uh, through various means. And if one looks at the map, of course, one can see how close Libya is to to Italy, and 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 of course uh, also from Libya, people can go through Morocco to try and get. Uh, through other means into Europe. And so uh, people smuggling um, and gross violation of human rights, etc., is um, uh, uh, an issue of uh, grave concern for South Africa and, of course, for the international community. But in terms of actual military conflict that has, um, at least for now, um, still been um, observed, and we hope that this will continue in order for um, diplomacy and mediation to take place. So I, um, I'll, I'll end by talking about the UN process uh, very quickly. The UN um, has uh, taken uh, in its last resolution a role, a, what we call a technical role over, uh, which gives a three months uh, mandate uh, for the uh, UN uh, support mission in Libya, in small, to continue um, for another three months but um, I think what's important to point out for the Portfolio Committee is that in their statements um, in support of the uh, um, technical rollover, these statements show the great uh, division um, uh, that exists within the UN uh, family on this issue. Um, almost all the members expressed their dismay that the UN Security Council was not able to find consensus in taking not only a firmer stance on what is happening in Libya, but by charting a more specific path um, that they could mandate. Uh, we should recall that um, the intervention in Libya was a Chapter 7 uh, um, UN intervention. And to that extent, um, the members of the Security Council felt that the Council could have taken more firm steps, but divisions especially within the uh, um, uh, bigger powers on the council meant that um, what essentially they did was just to say, um, whatever you have now, roll it over for another three months, rather than adding um, to the mandate and strengthening the mandate in order for the UN um, people who are uh, on the ground and who are dealing with this to take a firmer position um, with regards to um, the UN's uh, stewardship of, of, of the process. An important element of that is the um, UN Secretary General's special representative, um, Stephanie Williams, who um, has shown, um, uh, I should say, good skill in being able to speak to the different factions and to be able to um, uh, uh, extract uh, compromises uh, from the various parties, which is why I think um, uh, yeah, the, the, the ceasefire has managed to, 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 to hold. Now, uh, Stephanie Williams is an American uh, diplomat, and um, uh, as uh, the council divisions now have come to light, um, this has, I think, made the job um, much more difficult. Um, because the uh, faction that is uh, generally recognized by the UN, the GNU, um, has now just recently come out and spoken out against uh, uh, 
because um, in trying to find a way forward with these competing roadmaps and uh, with having two prime ministers, um, as soon as she was dispatched by the Secretary General to, to go and intervene and mediate to find a common way forward to have elections as soon as possible, um, she had pronounced that um, she may uh, consider a longer period um, uh, for them to hold elections. And um, the GNU, of course, felt that what she should have done is underscore and give support fully to the GNU's position which after all is meant to be the UN position. And as the UN Secretary General's uh, representative, it seemed contradictory that she was not giving full support to that, um, that position, but rather trying to bring in the other side, so to speak. And in that mediation effort, it meant that the GNU has now, um, uh, 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 in a sense, um, not only criticized her, but uh, felt uh, that they need to 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 state categorically that she um, should be careful not to be taking sides, and they alluded to the fact that she is now biased and therefore siding with uh, half that spectrum. So, Jefferson, um, we are at, at a very critical juncture. Uh, if I can con can conclude uh, on this, at a very critical juncture um, uh, with regards to the future of Libya and and and, and the region itself. Um, but uh, uh, as I hope uh, in my presentation, I've uh, also indicated, this is not just a domestic issue within one country, but also a conflation of um, great uh, external uh, interests, and therefore the role of the African Union and South Africa um, is important in, in, in preserving the notion that um, we need to support uh, um, constitutional changes of government, that we need to uh, support constitutionalism and the idea of um, having uh, free, fair, open uh, elections that are inclusive and so forth. Um, those ideals that we cherish uh, through the AU. Um, and so, uh, I, like I said, um, my conclusion was, uh, at, uh, which I stated at the beginning, is that Libya is uh, really um, in a very difficult, uh, continues to be in a difficult situation and faces a potentially even worse situation. Um, so we will continue to monitor and I think we will need to continue to have this engagement as we look at the way forward and um, uh, play a role through the AU uh, for Africa to continue to play um, uh, an, a more important and more firm role in supporting um, institution building, in supporting um, the country to have uh, uh, a maintenance of a ceasefire and to continue a dialogue rather than to resort back to conflict. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, uh, I will uh, hand back to uh, Acting DG and in our presentation here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Fadel, how do you pronounce your surname? Uh, uh, Chepas, uh, uh, it's Fadel, my first name. It's an Arabic name, uh, Fadel and Nasiruddin. Oh, Nasiruddin, okay, okay. I didn't want to get it wrong. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Chair, and um, that was the presentation. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Okay. Oh, okay, no, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Deputy Minister, whether we've got the ambassador of, of Libya, South Africa ambassador in Libya, if he's on the platform. Uh, Deputy Minister? Uh, Chair, we, we don't have um, a, an ambassador posted in Libya at the moment. Uh, but he's, he's home, I think. Yes. Okay. But it would have been better for him to, to, to join the meeting, or is he reposted? 
from Libya to elsewhere because it will be better to at least have uh, the last person who was in, in Libya as the ambassador as you have indicated that uh, South Africa because of the violent situation had to temporarily close. Yes. I don't want to say close, temporarily close or temporarily suspend its presence. Maybe we should say South Africa temporarily suspended its presence of uh, operations through the the embassy in, in Libya because of the security situation. So I was just saying it could have been better to have the last person who dealt with the situation through our office there to be present in the meeting. Well, because he's not here, you can do that for, for note. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, no problem. Just before I give the honorable members opportunity to to interact with the presentation. Uh, th th thank you very much for the comprehensive presentation, uh, Deputy Minister, for such a comprehensive, very informative, incisive uh, presentation, followed by Mr. Nazir. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. I think it enlightens us a great deal about the, the situation there. Now, in the in the presentation, there's somewhere where you you speak about the involvement of other countries like Egypt, Qatar, and so on, which are in in that region, there. and then supporting this group and that group in Libya. My question will be whether. South Africa hasn't engaged those countries separately, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Qatar, to talk them separate from the, the formal processes that have been agreed to through the AU. But rather, as a, because we have got diplomatic relations with them, to talk to them about the, them working with different groupings in Libya in a way that will help us achieve our strategic goal, which is uh, the stabilization of, of the situation, intensification of democratic processes to, through elections, and so on. That's, that's the first issue. The second one is on external influence. I think it will be better to, to mention those countries that may be involved in influencing the situation to get worse in Libya. If it's Italy, we must say uh, it's Italy. So I, I will suggest that you mention the country so that we can check whether the same as what we are going to be doing with Qatar, Egypt, and other countries that seem to be supporting different strands there politically, whether through our diplomatic relations, and other relations we have with other countries which we refer to as external forces, whether we can't engage those other uh, countries on the Libyan situation and how their involvement in Libya should be such that it helps stabilize the situation. If there are, there are companies that come from those particular countries, and may be involved in extraction of value from Libya for their own narrow uh, selfish interests. We should be able to say what are those interests and how do those countries uh, um, deal with their own companies that may be involved in Western the situation uh, in Libya. I think that that will help so that South Africa can, can, can find a way of speaking to those those different uh, uh, countries. That, that's the presentation on our members. We will now take hands from, from different members. Okay, we've got... Uh, uh, Honorable Hendrix. We've got Honorable Nkosi. 
We've got uh, Honorable Skumbuzo Mpanza, the acting president of Sanko in the Republic of South Africa. In that order. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Che. Honorable Che, I was in Libya in 1974, and the 11 Revolutionary Council members representing the people of Libya were very passionate about uh, 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 bringing down apartheid uh, in South Africa. And through the Palestinian uh, uh, um, uh, branch in Libya, uh, uh, the process started to send uh, weapons uh, uh, to South Africa via Angola so that uh, we can speed up uh, 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 the uh, downthrow of apartheid. So I'm very pleased to hear that uh, the policy of the government will be to assist the people of, uh, of Libya because uh, 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 the people of Libya, uh, when I was there, showed a lot of compassion and interest in South Africa. So I've, I welcome this policy position. We're obviously not going to send arms to Libya, like I suggested previously, uh, to Palestine and Western Sahara. But we will be offering uh, reconciliation services and offering uh, 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 support to reduce the conflict because we know it's more of a, a civil war in, uh, in Libya. So I'm very uh, happy with the approach uh, that is being suggested to the Portfolio Committee, uh, and I hope the Portfolio Committee will support it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Honorable Hendricks. Uh, th th thanks very much. Honorable Nkosi. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, uh, Deputy Minister Mashiro. Uh, the meaning. And, and the department, I just want to raise three issues. First, the first one is. Uh, at a UN security level or in the UN, to what extent uh, is South Africa actively lobbying for the resolution of the conflict in, uh, in Libya? And what would be or the attitudes and opinions of other important players except in the Security Council, where at least we know. But what are the other members of, of, of the UN saying? Are they prioritizing the resolution of uh, the conflict in Egypt? Uh, or it, to what extent is this um, regarded as an issue that requires uh, attention? Secondly, at, at the AU level, I think um, my observation is that to, to a very large extent, uh, the solution to the problem in Libya is externally driven. I mean, to the extent that we see active uh, participation by non-Libyans. It would the conference would be held in Italy, UAE, etc. I, I don't have a sense that the AU is actively involved in trying to resolve uh, the problem. What are the subjective issues, for example, uh, that prevents the AU from taking an active uh, and secondly, are the constraints? in the AU itself, uh, what are these constraints? Do they have to do with the geopolitical uh, situation and, and, and or are our countries or members of the AU concentrating on their own uh, internal situations and, and therefore neglecting or not paying attention to the resolution of the problem in in Libya. 
The third, the third and last issue today is around the geopolitics uh, in, in, in the Maghreb region, but broadly uh, in, in the Arabic uh, world. To what extent are these uh, playing a part in stalling and or propelling the movement towards uh, creating peace in, in, in Libya and that's allowing for a stable and sustainable government based on uh, democratic values adopted by the UN, the uh, AU. Uh, maybe lastly, I, I don't think that from the presentation, one gets a sense that we are actively involved uh, as a country in 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 ensuring that there is uh, security. I think what, what we're looking at is post-democratic uh, process uh, uh, mechanisms, you know, to bring about uh, unity, reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera. What is, what is our active role? If you look, if you observe uh, prior to 2011, and perhaps it was because we're part of the UN as uh, a Security Council. But prior to that, I mean, we seemed to be an active participant um, in in that problem, in that conflict. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkosi. Ndadembanza. No, good morning, Chair, and uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, for that uh, uh, opening remarks that you have uh, made. Uh, and also, sorry for what happened to your iPad. Yeah, I, it's really finished. It's I really sympathize with you, Chair. I was once a victim of a similar incident myself. <laughs> so, so I know how it feels. No, Chair, let me thank uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Mashiko uh, Jamini, and uh, also the acting uh, uh, DG, and the chief director who did the presentation on, on behalf of the, the department. No, Chair, I think uh, this is a very useful exercise uh, that uh, you have um, allowed the portfolio committee to engage on. Uh, taking into account uh, what uh, Honorable Frederick, uh, uh, <clears throat> Frederick said, uh, has said, Hendricks has said, uh, in terms of uh, the struggle credentials uh, and the progressive uh, nature of Libya as a country and uh, its involvement in trying to make sure that there is freedom and liberty uh, in the countries uh, of the world. So it's a very important uh, country uh, in the world politics. And uh, what is happening there is really a uh, disturbing chair, as everyone who has been uh, making uh, the presentation, including the remarks by the deputy minister, were alluding to that fact. And it's something that we cannot take lightly. And uh, in line with what uh, Honorable Ngos is saying, I would uh, appeal that maybe we, 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 we see more active uh, participants and engagement of South Africa as a country uh, in assisting uh, in resolving the conflict of the Libyan people. Uh, I also had the same uh, concern that it seems as if South Africa is just a, a, a passive not an active, passive uh, participant uh, in uh, what is happening there in, in, in Libya. But Chair, uh, what I also wanted to propose is that uh, because uh, these uh, presentations are very much important, uh, since you have recommended that we, we have them from time to time to understand what is happening in other uh, parts of Africa and the world over. 
that uh, our presenters, uh, <clears throat> maybe it will be important for us just for uh, broadening our knowledge of a particular country. Uh, even if the presentation will be dealing with the current dynamics, but just to get a history uh, of the country and uh, what it, uh, what uh, political uh, <clears throat> policies it was advancing and, and the agenda, uh, whether the country was once colonized and the, uh, what was their struggle leading up to them uh, being liberated from the colonial masters. Uh, and then some, 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 something like that, uh, <clears throat> sort of a form of umkhabulo, a chairperson, uh, for us as a committee, and then deal with the, 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 the matter at hand. But I think that, that background information uh, would assist uh, because we can't take it for granted that all of us, we understand uh, the struggles that Libya went through before uh, 2011, uh, which led to <clears throat> the brother leader, Mama um, Kataf, which we know uh, what agenda was he pushing in terms of uh, uh, positioning Africa as a force to be reckoned in international uh, uh, politics, which maybe some of us might think that even uh, his deposition and uh, uh, eventually his ultimate killing uh, might be a link uh, to what he was advancing uh, uh, for Africa as a continent. But uh, I, I think it's important that we get that uh, background information in every uh, presentation that we'll get maybe going forward. I want to, I want to propose that, that uh, the presentation, they also cover the aspect. Uh, my apologies, Chair. I just want to deal with this call. And uh, Chair, I also fully agree with you that uh, let's get uh, those countries, uh, external forces mentioned. Uh, because uh, it's not only countries, as you have correctly uh, pointed out, Chairperson. You also have private securities in those countries. Sometimes they go there without the mandate or the authority of the country uh, that they are coming from uh, because of their uh, economic interest, and then they go there and participate in destabilizing a country in order for them to extract uh, the uh, things for, 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 for value, as you have said. And then you have uh, mercenaries also who come there, the bandings and all those things. So it's important that uh, we also uh, get information so that uh, as we have correctly said, then we will, you know, at the side and behind the scenes, be in a position as a country to engage uh, on those with those countries and also uh, <clears throat> to make them uh, aware of what is happening if there are mercenaries and bandits and private securities that are coming from their countries who might not be acting in the best interest of their countries as well. So that you you will then deal with the whole the issue of all the participants there in a more comprehensive uh, manner than dealing with it uh, on a haphazard and uh, isolated uh, manner, which might not contribute uh, in uh, making sure that we get the lasting uh, solution to the conflict. Thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. Thanks, Honorable Mpanza. Dr. Faba. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, Chairperson, I, I, I just want to go to something a little bit else, but I do believe that that might have an influence with um, relationships. And I wanted to know, and it all began that time in the Arab Spring and the fall of Gaddafi in 2011. Um, and there was a stage that President Zuma and our then Minister of Finance went to um, General Gaddafi, and this was a BBC documentary. 
Um, we uh, amount of 12 billion US dollars were apparently sent to South Africa. And I know that the Libyan government at that stage, or actually not long, of, a, few, a year or two ago, after that documentary, actually asked um, for the return of this money. Now, I also know there was an amount paid back by then Finance Minister Pravin Gordon. And, and I would like to know um, if our presenter can maybe enlighten us on this situation, um, that we also know what our relationships are with the now government in Libya, um, that we understand that. Because, I mean, obviously, um, if the Libyan government um, at this stage um, want the money back, or what, what, what is the situation on this? Is it still um, a burning issue? Um, or is it secretive, or, or what is the situation? Do we know anything on this? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Fava. Um, earlier on, I was supposed to also include a request in the response to include uh, how we, as South Africa, working with friends within the, the AU and elsewhere. Are we finding other ways of working with different groupings, whether they are religious, whether they are political and otherwise, a way of working with them such that they can understand the importance of the long-term stability benefits for the people of Libya, for the African continent uh, and the world. Because I think if we, can, if we can do that, if we speak to the religious uh, organizations through the uh, higher leadership from elsewhere, including all over the world, to talk to them, that can help in bringing in an important political variable in the equation of bringing stability uh, into Libya. If it has been done, congratulations. If it's not been done, I will suggest that we try and invest a lot of energy, a lot of resources in identif we have identified them in saying each grouping, now that we have characterized them, now that we have identified them, where else can we get help to try and talk to them, even if it's outside the formal processes, so that we can know deeper what are the underlying reasons from such groupings for them to cooperate in bringing about peace in Libya? Because if we don't do this, if we don't do uh, involvement and engagement of society at different uh, levels on the ground. You can have elections, but the elections will not bring peace. The possibility is very high that after the elections, there'll be new problems. It will be like a revolving door. But if we invest in talking to people's organizations on the ground, talking to their leadership, talking to the people themselves, getting other countries within the AU and elsewhere to help us to talk to such people, engage these imperialists who are pushing an agenda of economic anarchy in Libya, and show them that they are, they are causing destruction in Libya by putting their interests first which are economic at the expense of the Libyan people and the African continent. We have to engage them because we have relations with them. There's other external forces which you are, you are going to mention. There's no way Italy, for instance, will not be part of the problems in Libya. So because as South Africa, we've got relations with Italy. We must sit down with, with the Italians and say, but why are you continuing to participate in the situation in Libya in the manner in which you are doing? Uh, so that we can find a way of, as I say, 
having external positive influence rather than external negative and disruptive influence. Over to you, Deputy Minister, and your team. Well, thank you very much. We would like the presenter to start to respond if there's any that you want to raise. Thank you. Uh, our presenter chair to, to respond on certain issues I will come later. Yes. Yes. We are waiting for the presenter to start with the responses. Well, th th thank you, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, Chairperson, uh, uh, through you, I'd like to thank the uh, committee uh, members, the Angamas members, for the, the questions and, and, and some of the suggestions and comments made. I think they are very valid, and I uh, think this is one of the benefits of having uh, this kind of dialogue and, and, and exchange of, uh, of views. Um, I, I'll try and respond to as best I can to some of the questions. There, there were some that were quite extensive. Uh, but to start with uh, you, yourself, uh, uh, Chair, and the uh, issue of the countries that are engaged um, in this uh, uh, process, the, the so-called external players that have um, been uh, involved. Uh, with regards to the uh, so-called mercenary factor, um, I, I uh, refer to the Wagner Group. Now, there are many other um, uh, players who are also acting as mercenaries, but in the Wagner Group in particular, um, I think is, is, is something perhaps that at a different time should be something of a subject of discussion, um, because um, the Wagner Group is not only involved in Libya, but uh, in many other um, uh, conflict, uh, theaters of conflict, um, including on our uh, uh, continent in Mozambique, Madagascar, Sudan, Central African Republic, Mali. Um, so one sees um, quite active um, engagement by a group that that uh, 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 supports um, um, military action um, in, in conflict theaters. And uh, perhaps we need to have um, a more closed um, uh, engagement where uh, we can uh, discuss um, the concerns around some of uh, that kind of activity. But at least for our purposes, uh, that's one group that we uh, um, have um, mentioned as an external player. But others um, that have also uh, um, had uh, active uh, fighters uh, on the ground engaging and, and, and participating in, in the um, military conflict have um, come from uh, countries like uh, Chad, um, Mali, and um, uh, uh, Sudan. And so, um, uh, again, uh, who they represent or whether they are there uh, as paid participants from uh, uh, some of the other bigger powers, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Chair, if, if, if I might just interrupt myself, I see that the Honourable Faber has his hand on uh, and up. I don't know if uh, he wishes to, to, to interrupt uh, with a question or comment. Uh, may, I, may I ask? Excuse me, Chairperson. I just had... Had... Oh, what? Sorry, Chair, I just put it down. Okay, no, yeah. no, no, no so problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. So I'll continue. So, um, so, so, so uh, that uh, that was um, with regards to 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 um, those who are actively um, uh, putting so-called boots on the ground and, and and getting involved. But then there are countries that are um, supplying weapons, um, but not actually putting boots on the ground, but uh, financing and so on. And to this extent. The Haftar faction was um, very um, actively uh, supported on the one hand um, with, um, with uh, um, Egypt being the main supporter literally across the border. Um, and of course, um, the UAE uh, or the Emirates um, 
playing a part um, uh, also in providing um, finance and, and weapons uh, uh, to the Haftar faction. Uh, on the other side, um, in fact, when the Haftar faction um, uh, received this kind of support, they launched a large offensive to take over the capital Tripoli. Um, and uh, through the intervention of Turkey, um, uh, who not only put boots on the ground, but actual um, uh, much more sophisticated um, defense systems, etc., uh, they were able to, to, to not only push back the after faction, but to bring about the conditions that um, have helped to, to have a, a ceasefire. Um, because if uh, Turkey was allowed to continue, um, uh, there would have been a, a much more large scale conflict, a proxy conflict between those who are supporting the after faction, namely uh, Egypt and, and um, uh, the UAE. Uh, and on the one hand, and Turkey and, and, and Morocco and others uh, on the other hand. And so um, the avoidance of a proxy war taking, taking place um, in, in Libya uh, uh, brought about a stalemate between the two sides and, and, and I think was, um, uh, in our analysis, a contributing factor to therefore bringing about the ceasefire and um, bringing the parties to the table. Um, I think members were correct to, to point out that the dialogue um, has been quite largely externally driven um, and South Africa has been very vocal in, in stating that ultimately the international community can help, can support, but that the dialogue must be between Libyans and that the negotiations uh, uh, of a final um, outcome, which will necessarily require, as we know from our own situation, our own history, um, will require some difficult compromises on both sides, or all sides, I should say. Um, and uh, that necessarily means that the Libyans will have to, to, to do that internally amongst themselves with the support of the international community rather than the interference of the international community. Um, so members are correct to say that the process currently is more externally driven, and that is because the um, situation of bringing uh, Libyans to talk to each other needs to be created. And uh, one of the um, important factors of the uh, um, uh, external role, uh, for example, from the UN, is to ensure that um, the, the ceasefire holds, and we certainly hope that this will continue and that there won't be um, an outbreak of, of, of um, full-scale armed conflict again. Um, and so the role of the UN is important in that. But the African Union um, recognizes that it needs to play a greater role, and, and I um, must add here that South Africa is not um, a passive um, observer in, in, in this instance. Um, but of course, South Africa respects the, the channels through which um, we engage. We engage at the multilateral level, um, at the UN, including through the UN Security Council, um, by engaging with the members who are on the council, actively looking at the positions, the, the um, resolutions that are adopted, etc and working with the delegations that represent Africa as um, elected members of the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. So South Africa is actively engaged in, 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 in the UN context. Um, but South Africa is also a member, as I mentioned in my presentation, of the high-level panel of the AU. Uh, and through the Peace and Security Council, South Africa actively keeps the issue on the agenda and um, pushes for um, the AU to have um, great involvement and, and a greater say in, in the processes that are unfolding, um, especially with regards to the fact that um, some of the members um, that I mentioned who are external players, such as Egypt, uh, is, is a member of the high-level panel. And, and so um, to answer the question from one of the members also, um, yes, South Africa is engaging with those members then at that multilateral level, but also 
um, at a bilateral level. Uh, bilaterally, we do raise our concerns. We do lobby for members, um, uh, both uh, at the, for instance, the EU level, um, uh, engagements with, with, with uh, other countries bilaterally uh, to lobby them to support a process that will lead to the elections and to um, uh, rather than fuel the conflict uh, through military engagement um, to support a process that will lead to, to um, negotiations, to the uh, adoption of a constitution and to setting up a, 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 a viable functioning state. Um, but of course, uh, one of the members correctly pointed out there are interests involved and, and this makes it a very difficult dialogue because um, uh, there are countries, especially in southern uh, the southern parts of Europe um, that uh, uh, are concerned about um, the uh, migration problem of people uh, trying to get into Europe. This is a huge problem for them. And, and so they have an interest in stability and peace and security mainly. Others have an interest in the, um, in the uh, oil sector. Um, uh, Libya is a, 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 a country with large reserves of, of uh, petroleum. And so um, protecting that and um, allowing um, the companies that uh, have um, facilities there to, to continue to do so and, and to have the security to continue to do that um, is in, uh, an important um, um, interest of, of some of the bigger powers. But I've also mentioned, and I, and I very consciously uh, noted this, um, because as we speak, we are facing a situation in Ukraine that I think starkly reminds us of the fact that at one point many years ago, uh, when we were looking at South African foreign policy, we spoke about uh, South Africa in the midst of a, bi, uh, a bipolar um, world where there were two superpowers. Um, and then uh, there was the diffusion into a multipolar world where there were several other powers and regional, uh, and, and power became more regionally uh, decentralized. Um, and then we ended up with what uh, became essentially the US as a sole um, global superpower. Um, and this is now playing out again um, where the tensions to have um, projections of power globally in, in, in various um, geostrategic areas, whether it's the South China Sea, whether it's the Pacific, whether it's um, in the Baltic area, and so forth. Um, we, we see this playing out, and, and in Ukraine is uh, the current flashpoint um, for that. Um, when NATO uh, extended its mandate, and, and, and I'm mentioning Ukraine because NATO is obviously one of the key issues for Russia in the Ukraine uh, situation, but um, Libya, uh, in, in some small sense, was a precursor to, to this whole idea that NATO um, intervenes under international mandate um, in a country um, in stark contrast to the understanding that NATO was purely a defensive um, uh, uh, mechanism for European countries, and how it is, uh, it was seen to be increasingly extending essentially its role, um, and 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 intervene then in Libya in bringing um, down the administration or the rule of of uh, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, um, and this has left the rest of the world with a messy. Uh, threat to peace and security um, and, and the situation in a country that has um, now descended into what we described earlier. So um, Russia's role, Russia being then one of the parties um, to, to, to the situation, um, supporting the Haftar faction as opposed to the one that is supported by the UN and the UN Security Council. So uh, it, it becomes clearer to, to, to see that the council uh, is not at one, and this unfortunately would send a very wrong signal to the internal players that 
the international communities in this area and therefore um, may give them space to to create conditions on the ground which we would um, rather not see. Um, so Saudi Arabia is another country I can mention that uh, is supportive of the Haftar faction. Uh, France uh, is an active uh, supporter of the Haftar faction. Um, I've mentioned uh, Sudan and Chad who have active fighters on the ground, but also um, Niger and I've mentioned the UAE. Um, so these are countries that have um, um, directly um, played a role. But of course, um, we also know at the UN level, for instance, um, the EU plays a role in having a broader uh, um, position of its own, uh, especially with regards to issues like um, migration and so forth. Um, let me just see if I um, can get on to some of the other. Uh, the question of, of history, uh, Chairperson, um, I, I fully agree with the member. History is very important in all of this. And if we listen to President Putin's speech um, yesterday, we know that uh, when we want to understand things, um, uh, history is important, but also our interpretation of history. Um, and unfortunately, in these briefings, um, we always know that time is, is, is our enemy. Um, so uh, we try and give background um, without going into too much detail in history. But of course, we will always be guided by what the committee members uh, need. And if there is a need to, to maybe spend at some other more opportune time to provide um, either a briefing on history, um, some of the history, uh, or to provide maybe in writing um, before the presentation um, documentation that summarizes perhaps some of the key points uh, uh, that are of historical significance to the current situation. We are quite willing to do that. Um, what we did in this circumstance was really to just try and mention some of the contextual aspects of that. Um, with regards to um, the question on um, the Arab Spring and the um, money that was mentioned, we do not have information about that, and I, I'm really not um, um, in a position to uh, uh, deal with that question because I, I honestly don't have um, uh, much more information than I think the member, the honorable member, already has. Um, uh, but uh, our ambassador, and I, I want to uh, clarify this with um, uh, acting DDG, uh, Maniela said. We don't have uh, an ambassador there, that's correct. Um, we withdrew due to the um, peace and security situation in the country. Our um, ambassador, who is in Tunisia, um, Ambassador Masangu, um, covers Libya from Tunisia. Um, he is currently uh, not available. We have asked that our colleague, who is acting um, uh, uh, in the uh, embassy uh, in Indonesia to, to see if he can join us. I'm not sure uh, if he has. A uh, chairperson maybe can announce himself if he has joined us, so that maybe he can um, uh, also give some, some feedback as requested by the members. Um, uh, Mr. Mate, uh, if you are with us, uh, please let the chairperson um, um, know. Um, then, um, are we working with other parties, um, and chairperson? To the extent that we can, we've worked with uh, governments uh, primarily on this and not with um, uh, NGOs or other parties. Um, uh, on the one hand, because it is not easy, there are not many parties engaged other than those who are doing humanitarian work. And of course, where we can, we would want to support um, some of the humanitarian work uh, that they're doing. But um, at the political level, no, because we want to support the parties themselves. Um, as I've mentioned in uh, my presentation, our focus is on the uh, various factions, political parties, etc. Now, I think it's a good point that was made, though, and I think it's something that we uh, take note of, uh, Chairperson, that perhaps there are other uh, formations that can be helpful, um, religious leaders, um, other civic leaders, uh, and to, to the extent that this may be possible, I, I think it's something that we will explore further and look into, and perhaps at the next time, uh, if we have made any inroads on that, we can report on that as well. 
Um, Jefferson, I I hope I have uh, broadly covered everybody, but I, I apologize if I haven't. I know time is always an issue, um, but perhaps you you if I haven't, um, please feel free to remind me to to address uh, any issues that, that uh, I may have missed. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Farad. You have really, you have really uh, responded uh, accordingly to to the matters. I see the substance. I see there is Ntate. Is it Ntate Madi? Yes, I'm here. I'm here, uh, uh, Chair. Lega. Yes. Lega. Tenkai. Siabonga. You are in Tunisia. Yes, I'm in Tunisia. The net here it's 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 down and it gets interrupted, but I can hear you, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you follow the discussions? I came I, 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 I came in late. I came in late. It was said a little bit, so it was a time when members were in questions. Basically, what we are dealing with here today is the unfolding political situation in Libya. Yes. And the whole that South Africa through the Department of uh, International Relations and Cooperation and other means, is playing through the AU, through bilaterals, and through multilateral organizations to try and deal with the situation in Libya. So we thought that if about five to 10 minutes is given to somebody who was the last person or who is currently dealing with um, defended deal with with Libya and situation as you are based now in you 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 in Tunisia but you are also putting your other eye on the on the Libyan situation. So we thought that uh, we could give you about uh, five to ten minutes from your perspective. Uh, I'm sure you have listened to Deputy Minister uh, uh, Masiho. Yes. And I'm sure you, uh, yes, but I'm sure you had the presentation by uh, Ntate. Is it Farah? Nasoreddin, I yes. also met that part. I only had, I only joined when uh, uh, some members were asking the question and when. Okay. Uh, but anyway, over, over to you for five minutes or so. You can you can cover a little bit that you the, you know about uh, the situation in in Libya and how we are we are dealing with it. Oh yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. We we are here in, in 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 Tunisia following the developments on a daily basis of. What is what is uh, happening in, in 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 Libya? So we we prepared the 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 presentation uh, that is being presented currently to 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 the committee. We we did a, give oh. a, a synopsis of of uh, the background and then what are the uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, matters. We talked to the issues of mercenaries. We also spoke about why the reasons. Uh, the elections could not take place. The internal actors who had been supporting the East, who had been supporting the West, after the 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 the, the, the general national uh, union, the the issue now with the 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 two prime ministers, we have got the prime minister, Mr. Bashaka, the former interior minister, and then we also have Dibaiba which makes the situation on, 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 on the ground uh, uh, very difficult because you still have uh, mercenaries, uh, uh, militias, and, 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 and everybody there. In the situation, it's very, very difficult to, to, to deal with because of the external actors and then militias that are still there have not left. So the situation on the ground 
it's 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 very difficult. We have been following all these developments and and reporting on a weekly basis to 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 the business to the business uh, uh, unit. So we keep on updating the the business unit with with weekly reports of the development because we are following them on 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 a daily basis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Mat, uh, yeah. for that briefing and for preparing the uh, the report. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you very much for that. I don't know, Deputy Minister, if uh, there's something you want to say as we wrap up. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and also thank the members that have uh, asked uh, clarity questions. Well, uh, I think the officials have covered a lot, but um, it's safe to say, Chair, that I think in all what we're doing as a country, South Africa, we, we, we respect the individual country's sovereignty and all what we are doing, especially the lobbying that we are doing to the stakeholders in Libya, we, we respect that at the end of the day is the Libyan themselves that need to take a decision. So we, 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 we have got no right to push our ideas um, accordingly because our relations definitely is a mutual one. So, so I, I, I think uh, members uh, can really <laughs> agree on that. Of course, on the issue of the se private security companies that can really be hired to stabilize in one way or another in any country coming from South Africa, we, we, we don't have that information, but we will check because this is a business uh, country uh, to country business relations. So we'll check because what we discovered that in Mozambique, there was a company that is coming from South Africa, security company hired there, but it was not hired through government of South Africa, but as a private company, they've got a right to trade wherever, but they've got no right really to, to make sure that in, in whatever they are doing, they, they let our, our, our foreign policy down. So these are some of the issues that you need to look at. On the issue of the money, we will we, we'll follow this thing up because we, we never really uh, uh, look at it uh, in that sense because it was an issue that was discussed at that time, but we'll follow it up. And also agree with, with, with uh, Honorable Mbanza on the proposal that you need to give a history. My take is that le le let's present, let's, let's send the background information about the country so that when we present, members will have a preview of, of the background and the history of the country and also get into the real uh, uh, information that is needed by the community, the committee. So thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, and I want to thank the collective within the department for the presentation. I think it is very useful, it's insightful, helping us to understand the situation better in Libya from, from the perspective of all sides. Uh, as a committee, it is our hope and it is our trust that we have in Derko that you will continue to intensify all the means possible through diplomacy to achieve the strategic goal of a, a peaceful Libya, a stable Libya, a democratic Libya, which will also uh, be embraced by other nations that appear to because the end of the day is the people who suffer uh, in Libya. So we thank you very much for providing leadership in that regard, uh, Honorable Mashio. Uh, Honorable members, there's a matter relating to our retreat. So I will give Lubavalo just an opportunity to indicate to us the dates and whether 
if we are fine with those particular dates because the problem is uh, the dates are overlapping into the weekend. Lubavalo? Uh, thank you, Chair. As, as everything, uh, and all members, we have two sets of dates that we have identified. Uh, the, the first set is on the 18th of March, uh, 19 and 20 of March, which is on a Friday to a Sunday. And, an, and another set of dates will be the 19, 2021 of April, which is from Tuesday mm. to Thursday. So those are the questions that we requested to, to give us guidance on which set will be more convenient so that we can start uh, preparing for the logistics. Thank you, Chair. Fine. Give those dates again in, in March. Is which the, set is the, the first set is the 18, which is on a Friday. 19 and 20 chair and then the second set is the 19 20 21 of april okay which ones are we comfortable with it is during the week and during the weekend uh, Chair, I've raised my hand, but maybe you don't see it, uh, that site. Yes, I'm going to, I can see it now. Yeah, you can proceed, Honorable Mpanza. No, no Chair, um, I just wanted to ask a clarity question. Um, is none of these uh, dates, whether uh, encroaching the weekend or only the weekdays, none of them are, are not coinciding with uh, uh, the calendar of parliament in terms of uh, leave or constituency days. I'm just okay. wanting to check that one here, Chair. Thanks. No problem. Honorable Faba. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, Chairperson, as I am only an alternate on this committee, I would just like to also ask that maybe I can, to cut costs, maybe just go to the Dirko um, leg of this, and um, then obviously um, let the rest of the committee go to the um, further oversight. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Benson, the, 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 the first set, uh, which Just is... Just hold on, yes, Honorable Chetty. Honorable Chetty. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I want to agree with what uh, the Honorable Panza has said, whereby we make sure we try to keep it in line with Parliament's program as well as constituency period. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. How's the now? Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Person, um, Chairperson. I just to give uh, more clarity to what Lubabalo is saying. These are dates for the committee to consider its own strategic plan and the annual plan, the annual performance plan and the strategic plan. It's not the oversight. So uh, the 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 set in in April. It will be during the oversight uh, week for Parliament. So it will give members enough time because it's during the week, it's Tuesday to Thursday. It will give members enough time to, to consider the strategic plan. And then the first one in March is because of parliamentary program that uh, members will only have Friday, Saturday to work. Otherwise, uh, if members uh, prefer the one in March, then it means they will have a they will have to uh, also consider working over the weekend, whereas the one in April, it will be during oversight period for Parliament. Thank you, Chairperson. I thought I should uh, just explain that. Okay. Uh, okay. Honorable Mpanza? 
No, Chair, thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> based on the explanation, I, I would propose, Chair, that it's preferable, even if it's not uh, coinciding with uh, the oversight, but it's always preferable to use the weekdays than uh, using uh, the weekends, because uh, I think, uh, if I'm not talking for everyone, but uh, weekends also have got other responsibilities, which are either family commitments or personal commitments that are not related to our parliamentary work. So for me, I would uh, propose that maybe we look at the weekdays and it's uh, more favorable that it, anyway, in, as, as a, for a parliamentary program is, is oversight. So it, it fits very well with, with the parliamentary work and it's not conflicting. Thanks, Chair. Now, if I'm not wrong, it was our plan to have that visit of oversight to Pretoria to the department during that week of oversight. Or Luavalo. Uh, thank you, Chair. Because it uh, means if we, my understanding is that if we use those days, it means we'll be forfeiting the the oversight that we're supposed to do to Derko. No, no, Chebesin, they are not at all. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Chebesin, the dates are not clashing, Chair. Uh, if if only members prefer April, it will be after the committee has returned from Namibia, Chair. And if oh. members prefer March, still the 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 strength plan will be in the week before we go to Pretoria, Chair. So the dates are not clashing at all. If they are not clashing, then it's fine. Honourable Faber. Sorry, Chair, I just uh, put my hand down again. Okay, Honorable Chetty. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Chair, I just want to find out if this is going to be the step plan that we are talking about. Isn't April too late? Isn't there any other dates available during March? Just a, a, a question I'm raising in the sense that surely it might be more beneficial for us to meet as a committee before we even do our oversight to Namibia. I'm not sure what your take on it, Chairperson. Thank you. Okay. Chair, I want to agree with uh, Honourable Members, in particular Honourable Mpanza, that uh, let's look into, let's take uh, uh, the weekdays rather than uh, taking uh, weekends. That was my contribution, Chair, in supporting uh, Honourable uh, Acting President. Okay, March is ending next week. So it basically means we are agreeing that we will go on those days of April. So that is how we conclude it. Uh, apologies, uh, apologies, yeah, Carlo. Members. Yes. We are, still, we are still in February. And you said March is ending next week. Sorry, 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 my, sorry, that, that, sorry. my mind is too ahead. My yeah, mind is, is... My apologies, Salo. No. That's the reason why I was asking whether we're going to consider dates in March as opposed to as late as in April because we still got a month more. So that's why my suggestion was coming in. And I can see where you had a misunderstanding when you thought you already in the end of March, so you thought it's next week. <laughs> so that's why I was consider us trying to have the meeting before we go to Namibia so that we can all be on the same page. Thank you, Chair. No, I get your point. Why don't we then agree that we mandate the chair in his office to go and look for a suitable date in March, failing which we stick to April? Honorable Mpanza? Yes, Chair. I think we can agree on that one with, with the proviso that, but even if it's in March, but it doesn't include weekends. Yes, the weekends are out completely. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. The weekends I are. Support. 
I also support the proposal of the church. Yeah, honorable Ngola. Yes, sir. We have whom? Yes, sir. I, I support the proposal Joseph, that you have just presented. That you, you the chair, leads uh, the process of looking for suitable dates. If it is completely impossible to get some dates in March, then we can move to April. Okay. Dr. Mbanza, is this an earlier hand? Yes, okay. no, sorry. It's the Lakers hand. Okay. Good luck, honorable members, for your, your ears and eyes are going to be getting the details about how what has been collected throughout the country is going to be distributed. And um, you, you can't change anything, so we must go and listen, and thereafter make sure that uh, we do the necessary oversight on whatever will have been allocated to uh, uh, what do we need to do to deliver services to the people? The petrol is now going above 20 rand. So we need to put things in a way that does not push us into the pit in as far as budget process as individuals is concerned. I wish you luck on our members, and this is how we come to the end of our meeting. Bye, Danki, Kialeboha, Siabulela, Hamanga. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Sure.